may I politely request your telephones to be put away? Thank you. That's the bell. And I'm now going to uh, start off with some light entertainment. A video. Remember at school when it was just before Christmas and the teacher always used to get fed up and give you a video? Shut you up. Slight part of that. I want to show you a really amazing video that uh, our group has produced to illustrate biofilm and the importance of extracellular DNA in biofilm. Uh, we've been working with orthopaedic surgeons uh, to raise awareness of the problems of infection in, um, in surgery and the growing um, <coughs> problem of antibiotic resistance in, in uh, situations such as these. Um, without antibiotics, it will be almost impossible to carry out such uh, deep surgery. So replacement of hips, the replacement of knees, and all of the things that we can now uh, achieve quite successfully uh, will become not possible. So we wanted to um, raise awareness of, of biofilms and how they work and how they might get treated to uh, an, an audience which doesn't really uh, know or understand that much about biofilms, namely the orthopaedic surgical community. And we wanted to do this through the medium of dance. So we wanted to do it through the medium of stop motion animation. You looked a bit baffled there, weren't you? <laughs> which was precisely what I was intending. Um, so, so here we have it, biofilms. And it's, uh, see if you can see the, the, the pun, uh, we've made a film about biofilms. So it's, the name of our company is Biofilms, so it's all a bit of fun really. So here's the culprit, um, Staphylococcus aureus, <coughs> as I'm sure you recognise it. Uh, these are really nice. If any of you are stuck for uh, Christmas presents, uh, you can get these cute little bacteria, cuddly little bacteria, which are true to uh, form. You can even get a nice little bit of purple Ebola virus, I think, which is quite cuddly. Um, and this is Staphylococcus aureus, and you can see that it's got these, uh, these pili, and they're obviously, you can see by that rather sinister look in their eyes that they're beginning to communicate with each other, aren't they? They're beginning to say, I think we'll cause an infection here. I think we'll quorum sense and get together and grow into... Oops, sorry. Don't know what's happened there. Oh yeah, here we go. And they're starting to produce a biofilm. Can you see that? Now some of them are lysing. So I spoke to Martin, the uh, clinical medical doctor who pr produced this. What we want to get is we want to get one ripping open and all this green stuff spewing out of its cells to uh, imitate cell lysis and release of extracellular DNA, but that's a bit too much. So extracellular DNA is denoted by the green wool. And you can see that polysaccharides are also being re released and secreted by the um, microbes. So can you see you've got a biofilm there? where the cells are actually protected and held together by extracellular DNA, polysaccharides, and proteins. Okay, three major uh, types of polymer in that extracellular polymeric matrix denoted by those three colors. So, this is the immune system. The guy in the tractor, uh, the white blood cell, the guy with a kind of sawn off shotgun there. I don't know who he is, but these generally <laughs> represent... There's a guy with a digger there. He's trying to get into the biofilm unsuccessfully. There's some, some coordination going on. Uh, they're trying to um, attack and break up that biofilm, but without much success. Oh, but the immune system can, as you can see, uh, successfully attack and kill and remove single planktonic cells. So you can see that poor little Staphylococcus aureus over there on the right, that's been successfully removed by the immune system. Okay? If there's one thing that you'll remember from all elected, it's going to be these furry little creatures. So this was why we did it. 
And, you know, you can see that at the end of all that effort, the immune system really is rather unable to do anything about that biofilm because the cells are so well compacted together and protected by all these polymers. Aha! Now, along comes, to the rescue, our nut bee pirates. So this is, these are representatives of our enzyme which comes in and starts to do damage to the polymer uh, on the matrix. Don't quite know why Martin chose pirates, but I think they're quite successful. So they come in with their machetes, their cutlasses, and they're, I think they're deep bashing with an ore or something as well. And uh, they're coming in, and they're starting to break up, chop away the polymers. And you can see the biofilm starting to break up and disperse. And uh, I think we're not quite sure what the crocodile is. <laughs> um, I, think, uh, I think he got a bit carried away. So you can see that the biofilm is now broken. The protective layer of extracellular DNA is chopped up and damaged by these enzymes, the pirates. Um, but the cells are there. They're still there, aren't they? The cells are still lurking around. They're still looking a little bit smug, if you ask me. Um, and now along comes our <coughs> trusty antibiotics, okay, which are the firemen of the, uh, the black uniforms. So there are antibiotics. I mean, you'll be writing essays going, what were those firemen? They come in and they start to kill and attack the exposed cells. And they drive them away. And at the end of the day, you're left with um, a clean surface. Okay. So that's our little biofilm movie. Um, there's, there's, there's Biofilm 2, the, the sequel. Um, which you can find on YouTube somewhere, uh, which we've given it a bit of a Star Wars theme, if any of you like that kind of stuff. So um, that's just a little bit of light entertainment before we start this next lecture. <coughs> okay, I want to talk to you today about marine proteins. Now, this is a slight adjustment to the lecture list. Um, what I'll do, actually, because there's been a slight change in some of the order of the lectures, that I'll just update and repost the um, lecture list in the uh, blackboard, okay? Because one of the lectures, um, algal bacterial symbiosis, which I'm not giving you, um, which is going to be replaced by this lecture on marine enzymes. Okay, um, I've spoken to you briefly about um, drug discovery, medicines from the sea, drugs from the sea, saving the world, anti-cancer. Um, and although there are a few examples of medicines from the sea, as you can see here, Yondelis being the classic one. Uh, there are other ways in which to apply um, knowledge and materials that you can get from the oceans uh, in a field um, generally known as marine biotechnology. And one of the uh, most straightforward ways to take things from marine creatures and apply them to certain processes and products is to use uh, purified proteins and also enzymes. I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. So we're looking at industrial biotechnology of marine proteins and enzymes and I want to give you a series of case studies um, and again you'll know about the clinical application of marine nucleases uh, I just want to flag that one up within the context of marine enzymes. So let's take a, a couple of steps back and look at this um, from outside our degree course, perhaps just as a layperson. Protein <coughs> from the sea has been used for thousands of years, clear, quite clearly. As soon as you catch a fish and eat it, you are making use of marine proteins. 
slightly more updated view is that the whole of the marine food protein market in <coughs> Europe is worth about 5 or 6 billion euros. The problem is that proteins that we eat are often, in terms of volume, things like soybeans and milk. Okay? However, new extraction technologies are making marine proteins, as opposed to non-marine proteins, cheaper and more economically competitive. And that's a really important thing to bear in mind. One of the simplest so sources of proteins is simply dried fish meal. So you see these, you, you may, even if you live or visit uh, a number of port towns, uh, you'll see that a, a number of them have um, factories for effectively drying en masse uh, fish, which uh, might not get sold um, to the supermarket market. And you simply dry the fish and grind it up into a kind of dried meal, and that can be sold around the world um, <coughs> as a dried fish meal for things like aquaculture and fish farming. And that's a very common source of marine protein. You can then get slightly more um, processed types of uh, marine protein. Uh, you can get surimi, uh, which consists of minced fish, which is washed and compacted and mixed with sugar and other um, things. And uh, you've probably all seen these crab sticks, uh, which aren't really, it's not really crab, it's processed fish protein. Uh, and they turn it into these, they, they turn into these little fibrous blocks and they stain it pink on the outside so it looks like uh, crab meat, but it isn't really. But again, you'd be surprised at the number of people that buy that. Um, and these products do attract sales of literally millions of pounds a year. So I wanted to give you some, some real examples. This is a company uh, based in Norway called Wellcom AS. And its key ingredients are fish meal and fish oil. Okay. Um, now, if any of you have eaten smoked salmon recently, then this is all part of that whole production process. Um, you can get wild-caught salmon, but it's very uh, rare and it's usually very expensive, and you can usually only get it in. Uh, certain environments, such as you know, country hotels in Scotland, uh, where they've had, where they've got line caught salmon, locally line caught salmon, or something, or you know, specialist suppliers. The vast majority of salmon to eat comes from salmon hatcheries and fish farms. And of course, if you're raising um, salmon in a fish farm, as with any farming, you have to feed them. And so what do you feed them with? Well, you've probably seen, again, either on TV or in situ, if any of you spend much time driving around the highlands of Scotland, you would have seen fish farms. Uh, you might have even had a job on a fish farm where you basically walk up and down uh, and throw pellets of food into the cages. And the fish eat the pellets of food, and they get bigger. Well, those pellets of food are very often produced from this type of material. Okay, ground up and dry fish meal. Um, it can also be used as pig and poultry feed. And even though this is a Norwegian company, it has six factories in the UK, in Ireland, uh, and Grimsby and Aberdeen, uh, as well as Norway. Grimsby and Aberdeen being two uh, of the largest uh, fishing ports in the UK, so you can see why it's got factories in these regions. There's a lot of fish in these towns. So this is also very interesting, and you can see here that the price of fish meal has gone up in recent years. Well, this is still quite old, actually, uh, and it shows you the difference between buying fish meal compared with buying soybean meal. So soybean meal is much, much cheaper. And in fact, quite a lot of soybean meal does go into things like fish food as well. Problem is, if you give salmon too much soybean, uh, it starts not to taste like salmon anymore. It tastes sort of horrible, 
so bland and it also looks very uh, pale. And because of the earlier um, thing that I talked to you about, i.e. omega-3 fatty acids, people now realise that omega-3 fatty acids are useful, important part of the diet, and that has pushed up things like dried fish meal prices, because if you put fish meal into a food, um, such as uh, smoked salmon and so on, then you'll know that the omega-3 fatty acid is going in, and you can charge higher prices for that product. So it's still a very uh, expensive type of um, food. So this is what we might call um, a relatively <coughs> simple form of marine biotechnology. So we are producing uh, products which are processed from the sea, but the <coughs> technology involved is relatively primitive. It consists of catching, cleaning, drying, grinding, and so on and so forth, and putting things in bags, putting, putting those bags in trucks. It's not what you would call high technology. However, it is technology, and it's what I would call simple marine biotechnology. As we increase in the complexity of the types of techniques that we use, we can start for, from um, fish meal, for example, and we can purify <laughs> specific marine enzymes. We can also purify specific marine enzymes from different marine sources, such as marine uh, microorganisms. And marine enzymes is a fascinating world where scientists and biotechnologists are purifying specific enzymes for very particular uses, which can still find uh, application around the world. And this, Norway is a great place for small, high-technology marine biotechnology companies, particularly in the north uh, surrounding the University of Tromso, above the Arctic Circle. There's a, there's a long history there small high-tech marine biotechnology companies. Examples of useful enzymes which are being sold and indeed developed uh, include alkaline phosphatases, skin softening enzymes, and nucleases. So uh, here's a, a really nice uh, issue of marine drugs uh, which focuses on, for example, marine enzymes in particular um, and I'll put a few uh, PDFs and additional examples up on Blackboard. Um, <coughs> marine biocatalysts, enzymatic features and applications. Uh, so there's a really remarkable diversity of um, applications of marine enzymes. But I want to talk about this group of enzymes in particular first. I want to talk about the alkaline phosphatases and in particular what they do. So alkaline phosphatases remove the five prime phosphate groups from DNA and RNA molecules. And again, you might have to revise your um, DNA structure so that you can remember what five prime and three prime mean. Effectively, these the designations of the atoms which uh, allow you to describe the directionality of a DNA molecule. And you'll remember that a DNA molecule, rather like a zip, has directionality. And you can see then that it remo removes phosphates from nucleotides and proteins, and these enzymes are most active under alkaline conditions. So the enzyme alkaline phosphatase will carry out that reaction there. A piece of DNA with phosphates on the end, and then you get a piece of DNA without phosphates on the end. You're removing the phosphates. And that's a really important step in genetic engineering. When you're trying to stick two pieces of DNA together using DNA ligase, it's very, very difficult to do if you've got these phosphates in the way. If you try and stick the two bits of DNA together, those phosphate molecules get in the way, and you can't stick the DNA molecules together using DNA ligase. So recombinant DNA methodology and techniques becomes extremely difficult. 
So molecular biologists around the world use alkaline phosphatase, phosphatase to take off those phosphate molecules so that they can readily join the DNA together using DNA ligase. And so the people that buy these enzymes are scientists in laboratories around the world. And if you think how many labs there are around the world, there's literally tens of thousands of labs around the world using these enzymes. So, uh, there are several sources of alkaline phosphatase, and they differ in how easily they can be deactivated. Because we need to be able to go in, take the phosphates off, and get rid of that phosphatase activity. We need to deactivate and remove the enzymatic activity. First of all, we have bacterial alkaline phosphatase. That's the most active enzyme, but it's also the most difficult to destroy at the end of the dephosphorylation reaction. So the, the enzyme stays in your Eppendorf tube causes all sorts of problems downstream. So scientists don't like that. The second enzyme which scientists have been using is calf intestinal alkaline phosphatase. And of course, as its name suggests, it's purified from cow intestines. This phosphatase is the most widely used in molecular biology labs. It's less active than bacterial alkaline phosphatase, but it can be effectively destroyed. And the way you destroy it is you add another protease to chew it up and you incubate at 75 degrees C for 10 minutes in the presence of 5 millimolar EDTA. So you can get rid of it, but it's still a little bit tricky. Now, the final example is an alkaline phosphatase isolated from shrimp. So it's derived from cold water shrimp from Norway. And the wonderful thing about shrimp alkaline phosphatase is that you can use it in your molecular biology reactions, but then you can get rid of it very easily. You simply heat it up to 65 degrees C for 15 minutes. So you don't have to add protease, you don't have to heat it to 75 degrees C, and you don't have to add 5 millimolar EDTA. So if you're a molecular biologist, then that's great. Oh, I'd like to buy some shrimp alkaline phosphatase to use in my lab because it's a lot easier to work with. So here's the, the gist of the story. Frozen shrimps from a waste product <laughs> to large quantities of cash. Scientist by the name of Jan Ra, R A A, Norwegian professor at the University of Tromsø, uh, was asked by a local shrimp processing company to come in and help because they had a problem. When they took their frozen shrimp and thawed them out in order to process them and remove their skins and so on, they produced large quantities of <coughs> waste water. Yeah? And if you've taken shrimp out of the bag and thawed them out, you'll know that quite a lot of water comes off them. And that water was full of organic matter. And in order to uh, obtain uh, a license to emit that water into the local river, the company was obliged to clean up the water and stop it being full of all this organic gunk. So it was a waste problem. <coughs> So Professor Yang Ra, being a scientist, rather than just thinking up a method of throwing this, treating this wastewater and getting rid of it, he decided to look at the wastewater and find out what was in that wastewater. And he was amazed to find that the wastewater was full of alkaline protease enzymes that the, that the, that the shrimp factory was just throwing away, that had been thrown away for decades. So he noticed that this wastewater coming off the frozen shrimps was full of alkaline phosphatase. And so he, working with the shrimp processing company, 
developed a process, an industrial process, to take all this disgusting wastewater from the shrimp factory, purify it, clean it up, and get hold of clean, pure, alkaline, oxidase enzyme, which you then put in these little tubes, and he put a little label on the tubes, and he put the little tubes in a box, and he sold them at humongous profit. And that was the basis of uh, a marine biotechnology company which was set up literally about 20, 25 years ago and remains active as a marine bioproducts bio company today. The second example also comes from Norway and is a really nice story. Royalty, Norwegian royalty from hundreds of years ago have, and you probably didn't know this, um, been known to bathe in baths of caviar, as you might if you are a queen. And part of that, of course, was the fact that, you know, well, I'm going to have a bath of caviar just because I can, and I'm rich. Um, but there was an interesting additional reason why you might want to have a bath with caviar in it. And that was because if you had a bath and you put caviar in it, your skin became nice and soft and you were even more queen-like than when you first got into the bath. In addition, it has been noticed in Norwegian uh, fish factories um, have any of you eaten um, salmon eggs? Sort of, it's like salmon caviar. Quite a few of you. Yeah, these big. You can buy them in jars, I think, in in, um, in sort of delicatessens and stuff. They're very, very nice. They're, they're big fish eggs, about four or five millimeters across. They're pink in colour, and for example, you get them on top of sushi, or you can just eat them raw on food. It's, a, it's quite a substantial. Um, uh, ingredient, for example, in Scandinavian cookery, really delicious, um, and I would advise any of you, that if you like salmon, go out and eat some salmon eggs directly as some investigated homework. Um, it's really good fun. <coughs> but what they noticed is when, when the fish eggs are actually laid by the, the salmon, they come out in a kind of row, so there's a membrane surrounding the eggs. And when they're sold, they're sold as eggs which are just not inside that membranous sac. So in order to process the salmon eggs, um, the factory workers, which are usually women, will come in and they'll wash the fish eggs and they'll take all the membranes off the fish eggs and then they'll wash them again and they'll put them in jars and sell them again at vast profit. And what they noticed was that workers who... Uh, hand mix the salmon eggs to get rid of these membranes have got very youthful looking hands. Their hands are all soft and smooth and uh, it's a very, very nice, um, attractive feel to them. And working again with scientists at the university, they found a group of bioactive substances in the uh, salmon eggs which actually enhance the growth of skin fibroblasts or skin cells to produce um, more collagen. So the skin is actually uh, regrowing uh, itself a little bit more than if you didn't use that. So in addition, there was another property of these uh, fish eggs, and that was an enzymatic property whereby keratinases you remember keratin as being a protein uh, of which, your, which is found in your skin. Uh, your fingernails is made of keratin. Your hair is made of keratin. Uh, rhinoceros' horns are made of keratin. Horse, horse hooves are made of keratin. Um, so keratin is a very common component of skin. And they found that enzymes in these fish eggs, keratinated, were able to break down dead skin cells on, on your skin. So there was a double action method of making the appearance of your skin improve. So it's smoother, all the dead skin
skin cells were removed <coughs> using enzymatic processes which are uh, more gentle to your skin. And there was also a slight enhancement, for example, of collagen production. So all of these things were soft, gentle, and led to an improvement in your skin condition. And you might have, you might have already used those. I mean, you've got, uh, if you want to do that without the use of enzymes, you use um, scrubs. You might be using facial scrubs, uh, which have got um, various little things in, in the facial scrub in order to provide some sort of scrubbing motion that literally uh, rips and scrapes all of the dead skin cells off your body, off your face, on your hands. So they use things like uh, crushed up apricot, uh, coffee grains, um, and also sometimes micro balls of plastic. Okay? If you look into what's in facial scrubs, uh, it's quite fascinating area. Uh, the point is, this is, a, if you like, an enzymatic uh, facial scrub mechanism. And of course, uh, this uh, technology was isolated, purified, and captured, and incorporated as a cosmetic active ingredient into this series of cosmetics produced by uh, a Norwegian uh, cosmetics company. Um, night creams, hand creams, uh, day creams. If any of you know anything about ladies' cosmetics, uh, you won't be surprised by the fact that there's a cream almost for every part of the day. There's an afternoon cream, a slightly late afternoon cream, just before you wake up, gel. <laughs> just before you go to sleep, gel. So, so here we are, we've got this one's lovely. Arctic cleansing water. Oh yeah, I just, I just want to splash that all over me. Arctic, <laughs> Arctic cleansing water. So from some really nice marine biotechnology, marine biology, you've got some really nice scientific, uh, really nice products with some solid scientific basis. So this is the, the Zonase um, story. So again, as I've said, hatchery workers have smooth skin. The enzymes are released by the eggs. So the little baby fish in its egg is trapped by this egg. Okay? And the egg is made of keratin. And what happens is the enzymes are released by the eggs to break down the, the eggshell allowing the larvae, the fish larvae, to emerge from that egg. Okay. That enzyme also, also digests the links between dead skin cells on human skins, making the skin softer, but leaving the skin cells in, intact. So it doesn't degrade or, or, or destroy skin cells, but it, it takes away, sort of ca carefully removes the, uh, the, the, the uh, protein that's keeping the cells together, so all your, your, your skin cells just float away nicely. Exfoliant. So it's an enzymatic exfoliant. And um, there we go, that's some of the marketing. Aquabutene, it was called. Aquabutene XL. Don't know what the XL stands for, it just sounds cool. Um, and um, that's the name of the company, aquabiotechnology.com. Natural and gentle skill skin ref refinisher. Oh, there you go. It's a refinisher. Have to get me some skin refinishing cream. If you uh, if you stuck a present. Um, and again, uh, you might be getting a bit fed up of me talking about this now, but um, I do like to talk about it because it's like a world first. Um, We've, uh, as you know, studied competition amongst marine bacteria for decades, and we discovered this biofilm dispersing enzyme. It took us six years working in a multidisciplinary team with chemists to identify it. We discovered it to be an endonuclease. It's smaller and more effective than other nucleases at removing extracellular DNA biofilms, and it has potential use in the clinic. We've been working on a number of different clinical applications for this marine-derived enzyme. Um, sinusitis is an infection of the sinus cavities in your face. Uh, we've been working with um, the Freeman Hospital to understand if our enzyme can be used to break down biofilms made up of bacteria that cause sinusitis. We, f we, we found that it can. 
Um, we're working with Nick Jakubovic in the dental school. Uh, we've done some work on plaque forming bacteria. And again, if you want to find publications by my group on this type of stuff, uh, simply go to Google Scholar and type in my name and all my papers will come up. You can list them by year, and so you can see the papers that our group published last year, this year, the year before, and you'll see all these papers there. Uh, a number of areas which we've not yet published on, but which we are working on, include removal of biofilms which build up on non-disposable contact lenses. Uh, have you heard of glue ear? Something that you may have had as a child. It's a horrible gooey infection of the ear, and it's one of the most common reasons for uh, uh, taking children to hospitals and having surgery carried out on children. Basically, it's caused by an infection of the inner ear, and effectively, as you might know, the inner ear and your oral cavity is connected by a small tube known as the pub quiz time. What's the name of the little tube that connects your mouth to your inner ear? No? It's called the Eustachian tube. E U S T A D I A N. The Eustachian tube. Now, in adults, the Eustachian tube is relatively long and relatively thin. And so it's quite difficult for bacteria to move up the eustachian tube. In children, however, the eustachian tube is physically shorter and it's also wider. So it's much easier for particles of food or bacteria to enter the eustachian tube and actually find their way into the inner ear of a small child, which is why they get this blue ear uh, infection a lot more readily than grown-ups. So we're working on uh, using our enzyme in glue ear. As I've all, all also told you, we're looking at its applicability in knee and hip replacements. And we're also looking at the effect or the potential of using this in uh, medical devices called bone anchored hearing aids, which is what BAHA stands for. So, bone anchored hearing aids are quite cool. You might have even seen people with these. Uh, they've got these sort of little round plastic things stuck to their head. And you always say, well, what on earth is that? What's that? That looks like a hearing aid, but it's stuck on his head. Um, what ha what's happening there is that uh, the, the, the stuff, the, the person who's wearing a bone anchored hearing aid uh, often has had a stroke. And as you may know, when you have a stroke, it often paralyzes one half of the body. And when that happens, it means that your left ear also becomes paralyzed and you lose hearing on one side of your body. You can still hear on one, the other side of your body, but you can't hear on the side which has been uh, damaged by the stroke. So what uh, uh, surgeons have come up with is a device, a hearing aid, which you will actually screw in to your skull. Sounds a bit painful, a bit gory, but in fact it works very well. And what it does is it gives you hearing on this side of your head. And I can't remember exactly how it works, but I think the vibrations sort of go around to the other ear or something so that you can, you can almost hear out of the left-hand side of your head again. And so these are called bone-anchored hearing uh, aids, and they're increasing in um, popularity because of the number of people that are suffering from strokes and they'd like to have hearing back in their damaged ears. The problem is, the problem with bone anchor hearing aids is that they often do get infected and they can get uh, biofilms growing on them causing problems. So we're looking, we're working with manufacturers to try and understand how we can reduce that. Uh, another problem in hospitals um, is uh, if you uh, are seriously ill and admitted to an intensive care unit. Question. How would you like administer the nut B in that kind of instance? Very good question. Um, in many cases, you would take the uh, hearing aid out, 
clean it and put it back in. Okay, so that's one of the methods to do it. Um, the other possibility would be uh, administering or using the um, nut B or, or antibiotics for that matter as a kind of gel or cream that we would use to treat the device on a regular basis. Um, so as, a, as I said, ITU stands for Intensive Care Unit, and you, can, you basically get tubes stuck down your throat to have to breathe, and in many cases, uh, patients who have these tubes stuck down their throat um, are particularly ill, they're unwell, and these tubes can be placed in their throat for days <coughs> and sometimes weeks as they're getting better. And what unfortunately happens in many cases is that bacteria will grow on the, on the outside of those tubes, uh, in particular pneumonia, um, and that can cause uh, very damaging respiratory diseases. So basically there's many, many examples in the hospital and in the clinic where we have unwanted biofilm. And as you'll know, and as I've indicated in my lecture yesterday, the availability of antibiotics is becoming problematic. Um, doctors are uh, trying to treat patients increasingly unsuccessfully um, because the antibiotics are not working. And so we're investigating the use of this marine enzyme to try and help solve that problem. So here's a nice little one to, to sort of look at it well. Uh, this is a really quite a uh, creative one. Uh, this is an example of the use of digestive enzymes from crustaceans and to apply them in the manufacture of cheese. So Munida are a group of uh, squat lobsters from the Adriatic Sea. Where is the Adriatic Sea? Geographers among you? Anybody know where the Adriatic Sea is? Very good, thank you. Between Italy and Croatia. Um, it's quite a polluted sea, but parts of it are very nice, particularly on the Croatian border, sorry, Croatian coast. And uh, this was actually a group of Italian scientists who looked at proteolytic enzymes in uh, squat lobster digestive tracts and showed that some of the enzymes, for example, uh, serine proteases, were very good at breaking up casein. Uh, they were from the squat lobster hepatic pancreas, and they made cheese uh, by adding rennet and munida extracts into milk. They carried out moldy tough mass spectrometry of peptides and showed that there was a more complex pattern of peptides than when using chymotrypsin alone. So what's happening here is that if you just use chymotrypsin, to make cheese, um, you get certain peptides appearing in the cheese which imparts a certain flavour to the cheese. If you use um, lobster enzyme, you get a much greater chemical variety of peptides occurring in the cheese. So what they found as well was that bitterness factors that you sometimes get in cheese were removed by the Munida um, squat lobster extracts, and they concluded that this was a promising avenue of further investigation to develop novel proteases <coughs> based on marine enzymes um, to produce <coughs> new flavours in cheese and also to uh, make the ripening process in cheese much faster. Okay, so as you know, as cheese ripens, um, it gets a stronger flavour, and if you look into the chemistry of what's happening there, <coughs> basically it's enzymatic production of flavour components. So I don't know, if, if, if like me, you like your cheese extra mature, extra flavoursome, then you'll be able to manufacture those cheeses, and generally, in order to get extra mature, extra flavoursome cheese, you have to just store it for longer. Um, and as you know, in industry, and in food manufacture, and many walks of life, time is money, so if you can speed up processes, if you can use different enzymes to speed up the ripening process, then you can get a more effective, more efficient cheese manufacturing process. So even cheese manufacture 
can be uh, affected by using novel marine enzymes, which I think is just a nice little uh, way of showing you that it's not all about can anti-cancer drugs. I talk a lot in my lectures about moldy cough, um, and I wanted just to revise very briefly with you in the last few minutes uh, something that I'd like to leave with you so that you can go and ensure that you understand this outside the lecture, and that is the concept of mass spectrometry. Uh, basically, you take a sample and you ionize it, which means you bash it with um, a laser and, it it and break it into little particles or ions, and the ionized samples get um, uh, pushed through a beam and they're pushed through electromagnetic deflector and the big slow particles crash into the walls and the little small particles will curve that way and they'll smash into those walls but some particles will uh, go straight through the tube and hit a detector that detector will detect them it will amplify them there's software analysis which goes on and then you'll get a, a series of peaks appearing on the readout, which tells you how big those particles are and what charges they have on them. And you can use these peaks. So these are the fragments. It's a bit like taking a car, smashing it into a thousand pieces, then looking at the bits. You look at all the bits, you go, oh yes, that's a Volvo estate, 1994. So you can see all the different bits and all the, different, all, all the car. Okay? So imagine doing that with some protein. You break the protein up into little bits, you identify all the little bits, and then you can work out what the protein was before it was broken up. So that's a very quick and simplistic overview of what mass spectrometry is. Uh, there's a slightly more uh, involved analysis of mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry, which is basically doing it twice for added um, um, accuracy. And this is uh, Molditoff, this is matrix assisted laser desorption deionization time of flight mass spectrometry. Again, it's just, it's just a description of uh, the technology that's being used. You stick the stuff onto a matrix, you use a laser to get it off the matrix, which is called matrix assisted laser desorption ionization or MALDI. And then time of flight mass spectrometry is basically detecting the particles based on how long they fly through the machine. And that's a, a quick overview of that. Um, there are some other um, technologies which are used in protein analysis. Uh, this is called ITRAC, isobaric tag for relative and absolute quantitation of protein analysis. So what we're doing here is we're getting into quantitative proteomics. This allows the study of numerous proteins in a single sample, and it uses isotopes. Um, and again, I won't go into the details of how that works. Uh, I'll leave that for you to do outside the lectures. Uh, here's an example. Uh, profiling secreted proteins from a marine bacterium in this case, Pseudo-Ultramonas tunicata, using eye track tagging. So basically, you can analyze very accurately all the different proteins that come off one bacterium in a very quick, very efficient manner. Again, this is purification and characterization of a marine enzyme, an alginate lyase, an enzyme which breaks down polysaccharides, and again, that's found in marine drugs, and that's the activity of the alginate lyase, and a few additional examples. This is a, a nitrile hydratase, another enzyme used in drug uh, production, this, in this time rather than drug discovery, from a marine sponge. So uh, the market for marine proteins is, of course, thousands of years old. Novel techniques and methods in protein recovery and analysis are changing quickly. They're changing what we can do in the field of marine um, proteins. Marine fish meal is growing in price and value with the growth in world aquaculture. And marine enzymes are also a growing and lucrative market. And they can be used in diagnostics, through from diagnostics to personal care. And I've given you 
some examples of that and some several case studies. And I've also, um, uh, rather briefly towards the end, uh, explained to you some of the modern techniques in protein analysis that are allowing scientists and companies to take greater advantage of marine proteins. And the final point I want to make is that if you want to get your product to market and start to earn some money from your product, then marine proteins is a much, much faster process than a marine drug. If you want to take a drug to market, it'll take about 20 years to make your first pound. If you want to get a marine protein to market, you can do it within a two to five year time scale. So from that perspective, it's much more economically viable. Uh, and with that, I'll thank you for your attention.